We have Jason Davenport from the BigQuery team at Google joining us today. The ultimate power of data really is how do you get it to that activation layer as fast as possible? And how we can do that and make that easier for users across the way is really something that we're, we're working to focus on in that. And then the other thing, which I actually think is even more interesting is, you know, how do we use things like Cursera and BigQuery together to bring power to not just structured data? And so the first thing in the, in the Big Lake journey for those following along is that what we can do is we can actually create things called connections, which uh, we use to then manage access to that data. So I'll come here. I have a connection created, which is for our lake access. And what this allows us to do is to essentially use a service account to grant access to the data and object storage. And then from this point, we can manage all of our actual access uh, using, using just straight BigQuery. And now what we can do is essentially use BigQuery, but connect all of these things together. So for engineers, it's a straightforward process. And then it allows us to focus more time on the cool things like, you know, GraphQL endpoints that our customers can use and all that stuff. All right, and welcome back everybody to the show. After a two week break, if you were uh, checking or watching the YouTube playlist, uh, yep, that's just sometimes how it works. But we are back today and we brought in like the upper echelon of guests when it comes to, uh, when it comes to knowing stuff about data and specifically knowing about BigQuery. We have Jason Davenport from the BigQuery team at Google joining us today. So Jason, how you doing? Hey. Hey, great to be here, Jesse. Looking forward to the discussion here this morning and talking some more about BigQuery. Always yeah, the really best. excited. Yeah. I mean, because we get questions all the time. And like for those of us that come from like the Postgres side, we're kind of like, yeah, let me let me Google the docs real quick on what, what those say. <laughs> but having yeah. somebody who kind of knows it, like that's that's your thing. So we're super excited to hear kind of your take on it. And uh, we we have customers in common like you've been helping our customers of BigQuery from like your side and uh yeah and so yeah fantastic really cool um so jason give yeah, it a bit great. Of you know, if yeah. you if you come from postgres you know what's great about BigQuery, right is it's it's similar you know it's obviously a little bit different and we can talk through today you're really excited to talk about the similarities so if you're working with postgres you know what are the things you can expect and then what are the other things you can do in addition to, you know, with BigQuery and other platforms and that. So definitely happy to get into it here and figure out what we can do. Yeah. And that is actually a critical, critical uh, point with the data layer story at Hasura because it's, we've faced this sort of a moment of internal questioning of, well, what do we want to do as we add more data sources? Do we want to normalize every data set and make every data set behave the same, which is like a totally futile task, or do we want to figure out how can you sort of leverage what's unique and special about each data set in a way that then you can say, I'm used to working with my data sets, the GraphQL way, the Hasura way, like this is the sort of the, the syntax and the way that I'm used to interacting with my data layer here. How does that translate to other data sources and other data layers like BigQuery? So that's actually going to be a really fascinating kind of angle to uh, attack this with. But before we do that, why don't you give us the breakdown about who you are, kind of your background, and what, what brought you to BigQuery team at, at Google? And uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously for everyone out there, uh, Jason Davenport, I am a developer advocate and tech lead at Google. So what does that really mean? I work with our data analytics products and then the BigQuery team to ensure that developers have the best experience working with Google Cloud. So within that, you know, things like helping with documentation, obviously, you know, being here with Jesse today, uh, making sure that we have the right feedback and, and the right development activities. And then ultimately, you know, helping people onboard, you know, use BigQuery the most effectively for really innovative use cases. A uh, little bit more history. So I actually started off at Google as a customer engineer, you know, working with a number of our, our large accounts here in the United States. Uh, and prior to that, I was a practice uh, director for a global implementer doing all sorts of data warehouse work and then legacy data warehouse work as well. 
So always fun to bring that to the, you know, figure out how we can kind of merge those worlds and you know, bring you know, interesting things like GraphQL to light. You know, I really find the app dev world fascinating in terms of how we can do more service level abstraction. So excited to see you know, what, what we can be doing, you know, even more with things like GraphQL to make that easier. Yeah, fantastic. So we've got like, you, you've got the the uh, experience here to tell us from the, from the from the history of implementing BigQuery for big customers and then inside yep. the inside the Plex, so to speak, for a while. And then uh, now now actually being developer advocate and knowing sort of how to put those into words for people. So I think I think we're at the right place. So why don't you tell us a little bit about um, this the unique case like you were talking about sort of there's similarities between postgres and bigquery and obviously for those that are familiar with bigquery they think they kind of know those already but a little bit more what, what problem set was bigquery designed to actually then be solving um and, and i think there's even been some recent announcements like happening today or what, when we're recording yeah. this this is going to go out in the future but rec like happening today uh the things that bigquery is kind of shifting and evolving to support we can kind of talk about some of that and then look at how it sort of fits into the hasura world yeah absolutely so you know if we go to the way back machine right in the 2000s there are all these problems around mac reduce right and working with large data sets and trying to figure out how do we actually make sense of that and BigQuery, if we go through the way back, was essentially the Dremel engine, which was open sourced in, I believe, the late 2000s. Um, and as a part of that, you know, we've, we've taken that and then we've improved on that in terms of the product offering that does not BigQuery. So if you, you know, kind of track that, that evolution over time, right, and the evolution of cloud data warehouses, a couple of things stand out. First is that um, BigQuery is bred off the notion of separated storage and compute. So whatever we store, you know, we're never paying for compute unless we're actively managing or doing something to our data, whether that's mutating it or, or selecting it or, or exporting or loading it. Second thing is that we actually have a number of engines in BigQuery for doing different types of workloads. And not many people actually are aware of this. So I think it's, it's great to call out. First is the main query engine. So, you know, what Dremel has become and we call those, you know, slots or units of compute. So I could execute a query, you know, in a large scale, I could run this over petabytes, you know, get that result set back. And that's kind of, you know, the, the use case I think BigQuery is most known for. We also have other processing engines. So BI engine, which um, arguably is, is somewhat poorly named, like we'll, we'll admit that is a, uh, is an in-memory engine. So it's an in-memory vectorized layer, which sits on top of the compute layer. You reserve per gigabyte of, of capacity. And what that allows you to do is for things like, you know, select queries or, you know, aggregates, use the power of in-memory for sub-second response time. So we have one engine, you know, in that essentially does these like petabyte scale queries. We have another engine for making sure that for you, your BI or apps, it really speeds it up. And last, and what we've been working on, you've seen some amount announcements so far with Big Lake, is how do we actually push down even more of that capability into the storage layer and then let users bring other file formats and sources in? So this is using essentially a universal uh, storage system. And what that allows us to do is to you know, keep BigQuery open. So you can connect to BigQuery storage from BigQuery compute, from BI engine, but also from things like Spark. You can interact with it directly. And then you can also, you know, take that, you know, work with that data essentially on the platform that makes the most sense and then push that data back and let BigQuery still do things like automated reclustering, you know, in BigQuery storage or managing things like your metadata in Big Lake so you don't have to have, you know, users and roles and permissions across all your stack. So, you know, a number of different engines, what I'd highlight probably for those, you know, listening in is... I think you can easily find the right thing that fits the use case and you know, happy to work with customers here to make sure that you know it's easily aligned to that. Yeah, because I'd say I'd say from the Hasura use case where we see BigQuery surface the most, we've or and and even there's a uh, I'd say it extends beyond BigQuery, but we get a lot of there's three specific buckets uh, come to mind. So we've got more, but one is uh, is uh, the reverse ETL kind of mm -hmm. format, like when people are using that, using Hasura to sort of 
connect a lot of their different data sources um, across their stack and finding the edges between them and then being able to expose those for things like a unified endpoint, or then we have people who are trying to actually just um, annotate or enhance their existing like user data with the large volume set. Like, okay, what does what does all the trucks moving at, at seven o'clock through New York like data impact yeah. your current trip kind of kind of concept? Um, and so for what you're talking about with this newer with this new release, where you can actually really say especially for that reverse uh, reverse ETL kind of mindset is any stack of files or anything else that you've got, archaic XML files, anything else you could actually have as, as sources that are kind of, that BigQuery is kind of actually running its, its own query on top of and then exposing those through its unified exposure, which then you could then bring into something like Asura and connect to your additional features or whatever else. Yeah, if you think about you know, some of the largest like processing platforms, right? And I think telematics is you know one of those great use cases that you just mentioned. A lot of our customers are you know, streaming that data and they're writing it to object storage, you know, using things like Parquet or Apache Iceberg. But then in terms of the access layer for that, it's traditionally been you know clusters and other things where you have to do grants and it creates a very difficult security model. So with Big Lake as an example, you know, one of those things that we do is we simplify the access model and then to do things like aggregates on top of that for telematics, you can query that data in place using you know, BigQuery compute and then get that result set back to your user very quickly with Hashura. So I think those are, you know, these are things that we're trying to do to simplify the journey for users, knowing that the ultimate power of data really is how do you get it to that activation layer as fast as possible? And how we can do that and make that easier for users across the way is really something that we're, we're working to focus on in that. Yeah. Also, you said Parquet are very, very much cooler than how I typically have been saying that in my head. So not pronouncing the T on the end sounds a lot, a lot better. <laughs> You know, uh, park park it is just it, so. less. It's just less cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at kind of what's uh, what's happening with BigQuery and see how we could actually kind of look at maybe this new big. So the new the new thing is called Big Lake. Yeah. Is so um, Big Lake was uh, an initial launch earlier this year and. It's really a kind of a capability of, of, of storage things or features that we're working on. So we initially GA, I believe we GA Big Lake for kind of that unified access layer on top of object storage a little bit earlier in Q2 or Q3. And then one of the things that we're actually working on on top of that, first off is the support for additional file formats. So Apache Iceberg is a very popular one in the open source community. We now have read access for that. And then the other thing, which I actually think is even more interesting is, you know, how do we use things like Hasura and BigQuery together to bring power to not just structured data? So if you think about a lot of use cases, you know, telematics, you know, imagery, all those things, like there's a lot of data that we don't activate because it's not structured. And what we'll demo here in a second, just for you know, those following along is how can we actually um, manage unstructured data using BigQuery and then use things like BigQuery ML for training that data or use other things in Google like Vision AI to actually bring endpoints together to expose data and, and analyze that in ways that we couldn't do before. So let nice. me go ahead and share yeah. up here. I'll bring you on screen here. All right, you're up. All right, cool. So what I have here, uh, we're just in a sample project uh, for those following along. Um, if I come over to uh, one of our buckets that we have, so I'll go ahead and uh, pop this up. You want to hide that that uh, Google share uh, or the Chrome share thing? There? Oh, yeah. Uh, I joke that it's been four years and I still don't know how to use a Mac. So, uh, <laughs> Save, saving my me. video editor in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so you can see here, uh, we have a number of images that we, we've we loaded up uh, for sake of this demo. We've stored these in uh, Google Cloud Storage. We're just in a, a bucket here to get going. 
And so the first thing in the, in the big lake journey for those following along is that what we can do is we can actually create things called connections, which uh, we use to then manage access to that data. So I'll come here, I have a connection created, which is for our lake access. And what this allows us to do is to essentially use a service account to grant access to the data and object storage. And then from this point, we can manage all of our actual access uh, using, using just straight BigQuery. So I could say, you know, I want to apply a row level access policy to your know, rows that I get out of those files. And I only want Jason to look at them or I only want Jesse. You have that unified governance layer, which before what you had to do is say, well, Jason has access to these files directly on Google Cloud Storage or Jesse does. And you can kind of see where this gets to kind of like a management nightmare when you have hundreds yeah. of customers interacting with that data. So from that point, you know, once we have that connection created, then what we can do is we'll be able to create what's called um, a, an object meta metadata table. So uh, you can see here, I have a very uh, simple statement just to get started. Um, I did not highlight the C, which is why it threw an error. It is a valid statement, but you can see uh, we're using that connection. And then what we're doing is we're specifying that this is a metadata uh, object that we're creating. And then we can actually also manage the metadata actively and BigQuery will do this for us. So here we're, we're setting essentially, you know, every 30 minutes we want this table to be refreshed. And then we don't want to have to manage this. Like BigQuery, you manage all these things for us, which is really nice. So what that actually yields, if we come in and run this, is you can see that we now have an object that sits in BigQuery and it gives us the URIs of everything that's in that bucket and then gives us kind of that you know, metadata that we would have seen from the, the view in GCS before that. Here's what's a little bit different though. So when I have these, you know, what I can do with this is I could actually select these objects and so when I select it, the binary for the object or the image is going to actually get pulled into then, you know, have that work done. So I'm not just, you know, hey, great, I have a URI for a file. Like, what do I do with that? We're going to actually use that binary to do some, some computation here going forward. And that's what this function does. So here you can see uh, we have a, um, a transform here. So what we're doing is we're actually calling Vision AI. Um, which is another one of our, our Vertex services. What Vision AI allows you to do is to do things like labeling on top of images. So, you know, faces, um, doing object or text-based detection. So if you need to, let's say you have an image and you have a bunch of license plates and you need to redact those components, you could use Vision AI to essentially first do that identification pass on top. And when we do that, and this will take a minute to run so we can, you know, keep it going here with it is uh, it'll go and then say, hey, you know, what are the things that we actually detected on there? And then we could build pipelines off of that to take action on top of it. So if you think about all these things, you know, what's really cool about this is before we probably had to create you know, APIs and you know, microservices and all these other things to connect these different data sources together. And now what we can do is essentially use BigQuery, but connect all of these things together. So for engineers, it's a straightforward process. And then it allows us to focus more time on the cool things like, you know, GraphQL endpoints that our customers can use and all that stuff. This is a, this is such a repeating storyline that we hear over and over again. There's just this movement of, of a lot of business logic to the actual data layer now, like whether it be ML on, on Postgres itself, or whether it be, other databases that are just moving more and more of their, of their prediction models and things to the actual data layer. So BigQuery, and it it's really, uh, I think it, the idea of it being a database is really just a mental model to help people kind of quick, get a quick grasp of what it roughly does. Yeah. But it's it's more like a platform that then can be exposed as a, as a database essentially at the end. But it's, it's more of an actual data ma manipulation platform of, of compute and these different kinds of even programming interfaces to allow you to to do things and so if you if you manipulate that and you get that all set up again even with these sort of like system level permissions we're able to say okay i'm gonna i'm gonna lock down what i need to and give access to what i need to so that my data engineers can come into bigquery and get the data layer from from my massive warehouse of data cleaned up and exposed the way i want it to be 
then it, I don't even have to worry about what I'm exposing when I hand that into a server or something for, uh, you know, adding into the actual app uh, consumption layer. That's, that's really fascinating when we hear this story again and again about this like sort of compute level or sort of these functionalities moving more and more embedded to the actual data layer itself, as opposed to query from the data source, run the, the computation in a, in a different cloud compute environment, and then try to somehow pipe it back in. In this case, it's running, it's running essentially at the data layer itself, even though BigQuery is kind of like a self-contained data pipeline cloud yeah uh, if you will but yeah yeah no it's what's really cool so okay, i think a couple of things that you mentioned are, are really important to unpack right first is if we think about you know how we unify data right data is no longer just structured files that we get or things that we can use you know a, an etl tool to bring in and there's things that we need to do you know in batch or in near real time or real time you know to really enable the practitioner journey in that so you know we're talking obviously about BigQuery in this piece but one of the things where we do this detection is this is actually you know a python script that we've deployed into cloud functions and then we're just calling that in order to get additional metadata and data about our, our images. So our images are essentially getting passed, you know, to cloud functions. It's calling Vision AI, getting some additional data, putting that back in the BigQuery so we could we could serve that back up. But that allows you know, from a, a user perspective to essentially bring the programming language that we need. And then, you know, bolt these things together in a way that makes sense versus, you know, what I, I've had to do in the past, which is you know, we, the, we create kind of our data layer, we create a bunch of containers, you know, the containers pull data out, you know, we enrich it, we load it back in, we deal with things like, you know, size limitations, all these other things that you don't want to deal with that are, are non-value add activities. And we just try to simplify those journeys on this. Yeah, you can see yep. here, uh, just for reference, like this came back and you know, for each of these images for where we could actually tag things, you know, you see that we're able to get things like, you know, location information, um, you know, what, what bounding polygons are there in the actual image for that. Uh, we can see that we have some logos. So we've obviously found some uh, G Suite logos, uh, shameless plug for G Suite for those at home uh, listening in. Uh, we also have other things like like Google on this, uh, another shameless plug for a big search engine. But you can see right where you know as I start to do these sorts of things, now I'm I'm taking these unstructured things, I'm able to enrich my data with even more you know components components of that in the process. Now, does this expose any kind of a predictable schema from what it's found? Because obviously, as you're talking about data sources like this, that it's uh, it's introspecting as we is sort of learning about the available underlying data set. When you think about combining that to something like GraphQL, um, that sounds very unpromising <laughs> in terms of what the data layer is, is being able to say. Here's the, here's what I guarantee you you'll find. Um, does it expose any sort of schema level promises or handshakes to the consuming data source? Yeah, so in this example, and, and keep in mind, you know, we can manage the schema at multiple stages. We can see that this is a consistent schema. So we're detecting for logos, we get logo annotations, and this is a consistent, um, you know, essentially set of, of definitions that we're you know, getting that, that data back from. Um, you can also manage this you know, as a part of, let's say I had a select query and I just wanted to unpack a few attributes, we could, we could do that. Um, or we could also manage this at the actual function level and say, you know, here's the only attributes that I want to return to BigQuery in that process. So knowing the use cases is critical here. Um, what you don't want to have, right, is, you know, we just take this data, load it in, and then, you know, see the value of that. I think if you read a lot of things about the postmodern data stack, you know, I think the key takeaway is that loading all the data in and hoping for the best isn't effective. So what we want to do is make sure, right, hey, if there's a business need for this, let's get that data in and let's serve it up as fast as possible. But let's always start from the business use case versus a, a technical capability in that, that discussion. Yeah, oh, that is, that is, I think, an extremely powerful part. Because even going back to the Hasura side, 
uh, one of the things that we we find over and over again when it comes to implementation, I mean, and when you're describing this, it sounds like somebody who has implemented a number of uh, data warehouses, <laughs> um, <laughs> is that uh, just because you can store it all or just because you can expose everything doesn't mean that it's always a good idea. So when it comes to sort of working with tools that can more or less automate a lot of the data collection pieces or technically can do a lot, getting back to solving the data model behind the business use case initially becomes just like a 10 X of level of importance because you're going to get yourself buried in excessive data or excessive, you know, interfaces that mean nothing to your business and are just taking a lot of time to wade through and make meaning out of. But if you start with the, here's what we're trying to, to fit the data uh, into ultimately, or trying to like uh, get from the data. And then down the road, you have room to be able to explore, well, you know what, we actually have some interesting weather data along with this telemetry or whatever yeah. else that we can kind of layer in. But you kind of need that initially uh, a framework of understanding of the business model that you're actually trying to map to the data itself. So um, yeah, it's a, there's a lot of interesting parallels because it's sort of like BigQuery yeah. is kind of this contained uh, for just crazy amounts and crazy a variety of data that then sort of becomes exposed. And, and it's a really similar thing that Hasura itself is doing, um, but with just more like the the end <laughs> the end pieces. So once that whole combo is, is put together and then consumed in something like Hasura and then layered with other polished up data sources, um, it becomes sort of a, it becomes a really powerful piece. So I can see that there's there I can see the BigQuery story shaping more and more because there's been a lot of cases mm -hmm. where users have wondered what is the BigQuery story at Hasura because it's it's wide table it's you know not necessarily extremely relational um, it's more like this kind of a final shaped table but being able to run all of this sort of compute behind the behind the hood that actually is synthesizing this data from otherwise unruly or unmanageable data sources becomes extremely powerful in that case. And it's not just a, let's take a really wide CSV and dump it into GraphQL. It's like, well, <laughs> why? Yeah. Like it, does, it doesn't have the value, but exposing tons of data into a synthesized view of sorts becomes like actually an extremely compelling uh, piece of it. So nice. Yeah, I think I think um, you know a lot. If you think back, you know, and this is kind of the history of BigQuery, right? Like denormalization was by far the most common strategy, probably you know ten, eight years ago. Um, just with improvements of the engine, like BigQuery is a fully like relational database in, in the sense of you know looking at the database, and we do things like you know full asset compliance, you know snapshot based isolation, all those those good things. Um, but where it really, I think, mat <clears throat> matters for practitioners when they're doing like these things is that because it's columnar, you know, all the benefits that you get in terms of like big aggregates and all that, like it's easy to do. You're not managing, you know, ind indices on the side to try to like get that, you know, very last mile performance out. Um, what we do is, you know, make that part really easy and then let you selectively get into things like search indexes, which we haven't talked about for kind of those like needle in the haystack type things of, hey, what is this text and how do I, I find a record for that? So, you know, we have a, you know, customers today who are, you know, obviously getting even further and further into like the high performance um, attributes of BigQuery. And it's really exciting to see, you know, where those are going and then how we, how we bring the, the broader kind of data cloud together with, you know, Postgres or, you know, now AlloyDB, which is our managed version of Postgres, um, all the, those fun things slide on up. I feel like the original paper writers of uh, data warehouse pieces, if they had if they had people asking them about like creating optimized indexes for a data warehouse, they'd be like, you're missing the point. <laughs> but like, yeah, if you put anything in front of a customer, the first thing you're gonna, they're going to say is a feature request. So um, yeah, <laughs> there you go. So, so we have, we have here is a big query interface that is, that is reading over, reading over a, a folder of images and then it's scanning, mm -hmm. it's running a, a, a processor on those to scan the metadata to actually find logo placements inside of there. So yep. how, 
how do I get that, which is really cool. How do I get that into GraphQL? How do I get that inside of Hasura so I could actually query for the logo positions inside of images, inside of my bucket, inside of Hasura? Yeah, so this is, you know, if we think just like standard data engineering, yeah, this is what gets really exciting, right? Is I've, uh, I've used the select statement, but all we need to do is change this into something that's like a physical like materialization. So we could take this and say, create or replace table. And I could do uh, lake house. I do that. And we could run this and then you know you have that essentially that physical attribute or that physical object and now you could register that into Hasura and then say great you know here's some additional data for users to pull down you know with with these images and, and those attributes of it so Should we try it we'd like to <laughs> let's do it Always it's love the company credit it. card let's run it <laughs> great table must must be uh oh here we go uh, I should also apparently take a SQL 101 class. Well, that's that's already more advanced than go. I would be knowing what to do. So there we go. It's all right. It's copy paste. Now, uh, do, does this it. run? Does this run every time you uh, you select, or does like when you're reading from the table, will it rerun that analyzation with like a caching layer on top, or what's sort of the actual? compute happening was this interval is this uh yeah so let's let's talk about uh, how we essentially manage like results and caches and all that stuff so in this instance because we're creating this object for the first time and because we're using remote functions they're non-deterministic and what that means is essentially the bigquery doesn't know that the function hasn't changed so we're always going to go back to the function to do that computation when we pull the data back now, once we have this in a physical object, if we just did a select from the object, uh, we actually cache uh, result sets for uh, at least 24 hours per user. And so that means is you know, if you have a service account that queries the same data or the same query and the table hasn't changed and you're not using something like current timestamp in that function um, or in that statement, what that essentially will do is you'll just get the result set and you won't use any uh, computation charge for that. So we do have a number of caching things in there. Um, another popular thing which we have is, is materialized views. So um, a couple of differences just really quickly on those through maybe coming from other platforms. Uh, our materialized views are always fresh. So what that means is that even if you're loading data to a base table, the materialized view and the computation engine will pull both from the view and the table to give you the most current data. But what that does in the view is that we, you know, compute and cache aggregates, right? So when you're querying, you're not, you know, scanning a petabyte, you're only scanning, you know, 15 gigabytes of, of a result set for it. So there are a number of, of things though, that you can do in terms of Im improving performance, but making sure that BigQuery is the one doing the work managing it, not, you know, you having to build a bunch of other pipelines in order to, to make that happen. So in this case, you've just created a new table from this, yep. this synthesized data set where we could in theory, uh, run an actual like cron or something that would re rerun that from time to time, or we could say ideally in this case for a typical data pipeline, it would be when I've when I detect new images in my bucket, rerun this job so that I essentially have a updated table, um, or you could materialize it and just always have it rerun it if it wasn't something like a static looking at static images. Maybe it was something like looking at the last twenty four hours of a security tape or yeah. something. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So another thing we we didn't talk about here yet, but we could we could dive into is uh, we purchased a company called Dataform for the Europe in uh, Europe. You may have heard of it uh, more so than than the United States. But Dataform is essentially a declarative managed pipeline uh, product, very similar to something like a, a DBT. And what you could do, you know, if you think about how you start to build the dependency graph of all of these things, uh, just using you know, SQL or SQL plus a little extra, is you can use data form to say, great, you know, when I have these things that are happening, you know, then on a cadence, you know, whether that's a you know cron or via API call, 
run this pipeline, you know, at a, a preset th time. So I just have my data, you know, as a part of a, another SQL thing that's being processed. So we're really working, you know, I think the code base world makes a lot of sense in data, but what we don't want to forget is that SQL, you know, for 40 years, people have tried to get rid of SQL for engineering and it has failed every single time. Every time. Uh, how do we make sure that, how do we make sure that SQL is, you know, one of the preferred things where we can build pipelines out of, and then, you know, obviously with that, then how do we schedule it and make sure that it's an easy practitioner experience? So again, coming back, we can focus on the value of things like endpoints and that sort of stuff for our customer right now. I mean, and not to throw any throw any stones, but like even Hasura itself, we generate SQL like from GraphQL. We're we're not working with ORMs or anything else. We're yeah. just saying we're not going to beat that performance when it comes to uh, unexpressiveness uh, in that case too. So we do we have the table? I, yeah, is I it, think like right, the, yeah. the data frame. Yeah, so we we have our table. Uh, the one thing, like, I think the data frame, you know, version of the world also makes a lot of sense, but I think there's realistically, there will be room for two going forward. I think those are, yeah. those are largely the ones that have, the ones that have won. Uh, yeah. So you can see SQL and Worm, you mean, uh, or, or what are you referring to? When you say the data frames, right, SQL and data forward. frames, I think those are okay. the, yeah. kind of the two programming, you know, paradigms, if you will. Um, I think the, for, from coming from the software engineering side, like I, I do think there's a lot there. And if you think about, um, you know, Big Lake and, and those sorts of things, right? Now we can do, you know, our, our kind of data framework and Spark with, with Google, or we can do, you know, SQL work. Like you can bring the, the language and the, and the workload. And so we're trying to make it easy, right? For everyone to just, you know, do the things that they need to do with the minimal amount of friction possible. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so we have this here, table. Uh, yeah. We, mm -hmm. Yep. So once we have this object, this, you know, from a, a registry perspective, a few things to call out. So, you know, if I went into uh, Dataplex, we would see um, BigQuery's essentially registered this object. So uh, for any object that we create in BigQuery, we always create a catalog entry for it. So if you have other catalog tools or things that you're using to try to populate metadata, you know, obviously you can pull from either BigQuery or you can pull from data catalog via Dataplex in order to get that. You can, can also you, uh, do things like separate. Like can you two step there on yeah. that? Because uh, I'm I'm not deep and maybe I'm guessing some of the viewers are as well. Yeah, yeah. D Dataplex and the catalogs give, give kind of a quick landscape because there's a lot of stuff inside of the Google Cloud Console. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of stuff. Uh, I scrolled two thirds of the way down. Um, yeah, so one of the things that we, we recognize as a part of kind of the governance and management story is that when you think about, you know, the, the world that we're moving to, which is the lake house, um, you know, management of assets across all that becomes really critical in that journey. So, you know, if I come over into Dataplex here, I'm going to come to search. That's fine. One of the things that we want to do, you know, is make sure that all of our assets are actually discoverable for users. So whether that be um, technical metadata about assets, so, you know, what is the actual table, the location, all those things, um, or, you know, business metadata that we define. So, you know, a popular one in Europe is who is the owner, right, of an object. Okay. Uh, you have to specify a lot of those different things for compliance reasons and that. Um, we want to provide that light layer and then provide a lot of open compatibility so you can take data you know, from the catalog and then you can use it elsewhere. So here you can see you know, I've started, um, let me close that. I don't have any start entities, but you can see here that for everything that we've been doing, you know, we have our, our different things here. If I come to this uh, raw images, which was that first object we created, we can actually start to get some different information about this just using data catalog. And then I can do things like scan it with data loss prevention, which is our essentially de-identifying and re-identifying service, or, you know, maybe view this up if this is kind of that uh, pre-pipeline, you know, EDA or exploratory data analysis that I need to run. Is it kind of so, like an open API spec a little bit, kind of like a swagger for Google data stuff, kind of, or? Yeah, you could think, 
Kind of, yeah. So anything, you can pull down anything from it. What you can also do if you come over to the schema and column tags is you can also apply policy tags to it. So think of this as, you know, hey, let's say, uh, I, I don't think I have any tag templates to find, but we, and we could specify it in here. But let's say I wanted to, you know, take this uh, URI and I wanted to obfuscate it for anyone. So like, I don't actually want people to know what the true URI is. I could apply a masking policy here, or I could just say this column is not available for the set of users in this data. So this is where we start to unify some of the different governance stories. So you can use you know, column tags or policy tags, um, but then we can also specify, we could add you know overview, we could add additional metadata to that asset. So for discoverability, you know, if we wanted to say, hey, this table is owned by you know, the data science you know, imaging team, we could come and then start specifying different things like that in here. So I could say, you know, data science team owns this. And obviously that is not good uh, metadata uh, structure, but we'll go ahead and save it in here. Oh, I got to enable it. So I'll have to do that part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good to see that the, the permissions in console bite even uh, Google engineers. <laughs> You know, that's a, uh, it's always a, a uh, thing that happens. I'll put it at that. Yeah, uh, this is yeah, why yeah. I was using Terraform to manage your APIs. Uh, but yeah, so we can get that, those things in here. Yeah, you know, we can obviously add things like labels. So a lot of our customers use labels for um, things like cost management. You know, hey, this object is primarily used by this group. If I need to do things like assign storage costs, and then we can also you know, pull this straight forward you know, here. If I just click this resource URL, um, we're gonna go direct to that object and BigQuery it and start to pull it through. So all this kind of comes back together as, as a way to say, you know, when you think about what we then register into you know, the, the GraphQL endpoints, there's a lot of ways of doing that discovery and then selectively saying, you know, how do we control access or how do we think about access management on top of that? So. A lot of cool things in flight for yeah it. seriously so we so that was the that was the kind of a sidestep into what uh dataplex is and and how that functions so you we've got the table created it registered itself in the catalog which would then make yep. it available inside of dataplex if we wanted to be able to kind of ins inspect information about the schema itself um, and so now that we have this uh, this table entry inside BigQuery, how do we how do we now get access to this uh, to bring it so we could actually go into GraphQL land and start playing with it with the rest of our fancy application that's looking for logos. Brand yeah, spot. so yeah, here here's what's great, right? We created it. Like now it's just a table that you can go and register. And I like, yeah. I don't mean to oversimplify it than uh, yeah. <laughs> overcomplicate it, right? Uh, like now that we've done that, right? Like we could say, hey, here's a pipeline to feed this, but we can see that we've actually, you know, we've created this object. We can see the different storage attributes of it. Like we can just pull it into whatever, you know, service connection we have from the Hasura side. So if you're, you know, if you got everything set up, you know, obviously um, you'd have to check your service account grant access. But once you have that, then all of this is going to be, you know, queryable or things that you can register for for endpoints to query on that. Well, let's uh, let's walk through actually connecting this table into uh, Hasura to kind of wrap up this little bit of a demo here. Um, but uh, and we can kind of just prove to people that it actually works. <laughs> All right, so I've got a thing here, uh, Dynamics Gunk. I'm going to go and make a new project. Which uh, which cloud region were you uh, running BigQuery out of? I'm just in U.S. multi-region. U.S. multi-region? Because I have probably do U.S. Los Angeles. It'll give me a little bit of latency, but it'll work well for That's um, fine. for the data reading. So we've got diverse sturgeon. I love these names. I'm going to go ahead and uh, give it a second for the console to be uh, happy. We'll go ahead and launch this up here. Cool. Are these uh, are these strings that are going to be blown away here, or like um, will they be deleted shortly, or like credentials or database, or do we need to protect the strings from not going on the screen here? Uh, I just need the uh, service account, which will grant the uh, data set owner to. 
All right. So. Or data viewer, I believe, uh, metadata viewer and BigQuery user. So service account key, which if we uh, look at the information on it, is that something that you provide that. or is that something yeah. that does something? Yeah, I'll provide that. You see chat here inside of the, the uh, yep. back end here. What I want to do is just temporarily take my uh, take my screen off so we can paste in the secrets. All right, so we've gotten all the secrets shared back and forth, which, I mean, we weren't going to share like big query credentials with all of you. We trust you, but but we don't. So, and it's um, not fun. It's <laughs> not fun. Not uh, fun. I mean, the, it's in the docs if you want to figure out exactly what you got to do for uh, setting it up, but it's really straightforward. Anyways, I connected it. Here's kind of roughly how it works. There's this big connection string that I put as an environment variable, and then you need to give your project ID followed by the name of the data set you're working with. And I just put a, a global uh, limit of 50 on the select here because BigQuery could have a lot of data if you don't put a limit on what you're trying to select. So um, I ran it already to make sure that it actually works. So that's why you see this little green box. So we come over here to the um, data set and we'll see that it's actually discovered then the tables that we want to be able to track. So we'll go ahead and hit track all for our tables here. And we'll say, yeah, that's fine. We're going to go ahead and uh, move them all in there. And it's complaining because type currently in support for BigQuery struct scout. Yeah, so for some tables, you might need to flatten that. Uh, for our logos one here, if we uh, pull in the track for that, we should have a, you know, a, a string type. But sometimes yes. you need to flatten objects here just for those at home following along. Sometimes, okay. Sometimes you don't track everything. You just track the final product. <laughs> so yeah. we have the uh, we have our uh, table here now. So if we go to our uh, data to actually query, let's come over to API here. And so it should just be now underneath this, uh, this uh, logos field here where we could then uh, drill down and say, logos defined is this going to return a json type or what does it return for the the result yeah so we've uh we've started a string um in the database but you could choose to unpack that as a part of just pulling it across you maybe you want you know logo annotations in each you know uh field and that is, is a record um you can choose to unpack essentially the way that's the most appropriate for the use case and so here we can see yeah, if you need to do like further unpacking, we obviously have each edge or vertice. Vertice, you could choose to you know just get the description, um, a number of things here, right? It's kind of a choose your adventure past past the yeah. stage. Yeah, I wonder if that would be a good use case for like a JSON B type. Is that is that supported from the BigQuery um, exports? Yeah, so we have a JSON support now as one of our data types. So you could obviously select that and then. Yeah, JSON, obviously, the one, one call, right, is it's variable schema. Yeah. So depending on if users are trying to drill into it, you know, that's the uh, the only kind of caveat in there versus a, a strong yeah. client schema for it. Though what would be nice is like a JSON B type where then you could potentially be going a bit more specific and say, okay, we're, we're going to filter. Um, we have some, some special supports for JSON B. But I mean, this is where we come into the big query trade-offs and figuring out, okay, how do you handle yeah. the large amounts of data? What do you stuff it in as? But I mean, so so here we have like logos, like or I get an image that was uh, scanned. So this is the this is an image that was scanned and then it has the logos that were found. Is that is that the case or? Yep. I found yeah, El so Camino case, College. El Camino College. And we also actually have the, the polygon location of that. So if you needed to, you know, depending on, on how you're hosting this, right, if you needed to redact an image of that, you know, you could pass these into parsers and they'll say, great, you know, here's the part that I need to, you know, blur or, you know, remove from that. Um, you know, think of like your know, corporate logo uses and all that sort of stuff. There's there's a number of use cases for it, or things like PII. You know, do I need yeah, to yeah. remove you know, facial things? You know, that that sort of stuff. There's obviously a number of different ways you can you can track for that, or even just training data sets, right? Because you could just feed in what what it yeah. found and then allow a user to manually go in and 
and clean up the bounding box too and, and write that back into the data layer to say, okay, we're going to use this now. This is a, we're going to build a training tool with BigQuery as the source and be able to, using a Google API from a, re, from a REST connector here, be able to update that, that core data set through some sort of like a, a REST interface that we would expose through an action to say, okay, here's the new bounding box, write that back in and be able to see the results. So that's a, that's really like, I mean, I think the, I think the story is is that BigQuery provides this data platform for making sense and and cleaning up and structuring all different kinds of data. And the the Hasura plus plus BigQuery story is how do you get a a data pipeline that's already got you know provisioning it's already part of your infrastructure. How do you get that into a tool that you're then able to add in like the the uh, column level permissions, the row level permissions that Hasura provides for your app building. Uh, and you're, you're literally feeding right into your entire data warehouse uh, ecosystem. So I think that's kind of kind of really where BigQuery ultimately shines is it's sort of this tap on all this different kinds of data set that you have brought into uh, you know the GraphQL ecosystem, how you're used to building applications already and your different charting libraries or whatever else you have. So really, really yeah, uh, fantastic stuff. Yeah, up, good. No, no, okay. I think you summed it up great. Like this is really, you know, we need to meet practitioners where they are in particular from the data storage and computation perspective. So how we can do that, you know, with BigQuery, with other, you know, Google data products, you know, the, the goal here, right, is that we're, we're unlocking value, not, you know, making it impossible to get to value in that, that state. Yeah, because Google, that's what they do. They process data and structure it, organize it. A lot of data. Get way, a lot of data. Yeah. And and how it gets into the application is they have tools for it, but it's not the space that they focus on at the moment. They try to provide the ways to get access to it that are common, but like it's not not the thing they're most focused on. Is It's more on how do you actually structure this. So. Really fantastic. Jason, thanks for coming on the show today. Is there anything that you would uh, recommend people have a look at if they wanted to level up their BigQuery knowledge or be able to sort of go deeper? Any like three points that you would give them to to look into? Yeah, uh, for the for those at home, I would say, you know, obviously we, we have free trial. So please, you know, get in there, you know, play with Google services. Uh, there's some documentation pieces, YouTube videos, uh, Cloud Hero, or sorry, Skills Boosts, um, all those things to get started. But you know, get in there and, and start playing with it. I think is the the fastest way here to seeing how you can unlock the value for it. Awesome, awesome, great. That's gonna wrap it for today's show. Again, we appreciate having Jason on and actually seeing the the bigger picture of BigQuery uh, inside of Hasura as well. So that was a lot of fun, and I think something that a lot more people will be able to take advantage of and understand how does it actually fit and how does the support for BigQuery and Hasura fit into the bigger ecosystem. So uh, thanks again. That's going to do it for this show. And we will catch you all next time for more databases, more data sources. And uh, that's it for this time. See y'all. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse.